Good afternoon or morning. We're kind of in the middle right before lunch. Uh, it is awesome to be here. My name is David Boki, and I am really excited about talking to you today about governance. I was just talking to my colleague yesterday and mentioned that it's only two days in the conference, but I'm feeling all this energy. I've been at the booth for the last two days talking to cust existing customers and new customers, and it's just incredibly energizing to be around tens of thousands of people that love this stuff that we do. Um, so normally in your day-to-day -day life, you can't even explain what you do to the person that you're meeting at a dinner party, and here, everyone is in the same field. Uh, the majority, vast majority of us love this, and we're doing it because we have a passion for it, and so it's, it's really my pleasure um, to speak to you uh, about the topic of governance today. The, um, the main thing uh, that I, I want to get across uh, in this talk is the power of governance at scale for your large enterprise. Um, before I, before I, I jump into the talk, though, I'll level set a little bit. I had kind of a little bit of a governance uh, adventure on my way here on the flight. I was boarding the plane, and as I boarded the plane, the flight attendant asked me to see my boarding pass. And I said, oh, it's okay, I know where my seat is. Uh, I, you know, you don't need to look at it. She's like, no, I wanna make sure that you're on the correct flight. Um, after all the TSA checks and the, and the gate checks and all that stuff, we had that one final check at the, at the entrance of the plane. Um, so I'm gonna do a little like, gate check right now, make sure all of you are on the correct flight. Um, we're gonna be talking for the next hour about governance. Um, I'm gonna explain what it is. I'm going to then talk about that in context of large scale public cloud adoption and what that means for um, that use case. And then I'll share with you the maturity models that I see from a day-to-day -day basis. I have one of the coolest jobs in the world. I get, not quite as cool as Werner's, but I do get to meet on a week-to-week -week basis large enterprises, large government organizations that are highly regulated and really fundamentally want to look at governance automation as a way to enable their cloud strategy. I talk to them, I understand their problems, I identify their pain points, I help them orchestrate solutions for that, and always in the, always in the mindset of how can we do this through automation and not do it through manual processes. Um, I then get to take all that information I learn and turn around and work with by far the best development organization I've ever worked with and share those requirements with them and then they produce some amazing software for those companies to use. So it's a very cool job. I'm gonna share with you a lot of the maturity models that I see in large scale public cloud adoption as it comes to governance and kind of where some of the pitfalls are. Uh, and then a lot of us are here because we love cloud. We love building things in the cloud. And as governance architects, you probably wanna build this stuff yourself. Um, I have built this stuff myself before. Our, a lot of members on our team have done that as well. We love it, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I'm gonna walk through a solution architecture for how you would go ahead and build your own automation for large, uh, for large scale uh, cloud governance. And then I'll show you a demo of the way we approach the problem uh, looking at our tools. So if everybody's on the right flight, we'll go ahead and get started. The first thing I like to do in describing governance and talking about it is really frame it in the context of something that we're all familiar with. And we're all familiar with governments. That's where the word governance came from came from, we are all citizens of some government, and those governments do a great or not so great job of actually providing governance um, for their citizens. So let's talk about what we expect from our government, right? First thing we expect from our government is policy, right? We want them to set rules and laws around how the government is operated and what the people can and can't do. Uh, they also want them to provide oversight, so we want them to police what's going on. We also want them to have judges that can adjudic adjudicate the gray areas in that space. Uh, and then from a management standpoint, the government, they want, we give them tax dollars and then hopefully they build infrastructure for us, roads, bridges, schools. We need those things in order to operate as a society. And it's, it's generally better if there is some amount of government oversight into how those services are provided. We can argue about if it's big government or small government, but there needs to be some. Uh, finally, the thing that most people think about when they think of cloud governance um, is protection, and that's the same thing for governments. As a citizen of a country, you wanna be protected from external threats and internal threats. You wanna be protected from your neighbor doing bad things as well as like foreign governments doing bad things, right? 
finally, we believe fundamentally, Turbot fundamentally believes, and, and I do as well, that an element of good governance, whether it's government or IT governance, is transparency. Transparency of what are the rules? How are those rules being applied? Are, how are the people who are adjudicating the rules approaching that? And what's the cost of them to do that? Where is our tax dollars going? Um, where is the spend going, et cetera? Right? So we believe fundamentally that that transparency is a huge part of it. And all of these things apply, um, in the next section we're gonna talk about all these things apply to IT governance as well, especially in the cloud space. We have frameworks and policies in IT. Um, we have auditors that come around and make sure that people are following them. Uh, we also create infrastructure uh, in terms of VPCs, in terms of you know, networking, logging, et cetera. Um, we also protect ourselves from threats, uh, from people trying to steal our data, from insiders trying to do bad things, or from insiders doing stupid things. And hopefully, through that process, you create transparency as well into what you're doing, how you're doing it, and who's doing what. What is that in service to? I believe in government, and there's probably some, some governments that don't agree with this, but I believe the purpose of government and the purpose of that government providing governance is to provide freedom for citizens, right? So if governance is working appropriately, people who are law-abiding have freedom and can do what they need to do without the government getting in their way. In the same way, IT governance should be designed to provide freedom for the people that are using your applications and building your applications and analyzing data within your environment. So it's a data scientist, it's an end user, it's an application development team. They're the ones, they're the citizens of this environment, right? They're the ones that we're governing over. And our job as governance architects is to build things in a way that gives them freedom. How can I give them freedom and have them do what they need to do? So that freedom is going to be best enjoyed if it happens quickly, right? If, uh, if in the government scenario, if you're falsely ac uh, accused of a crime and you're in jail for seven years waiting for, uh, waiting for your trial and then you're acquitted at trial, that probably doesn't feel like good governance to you, right? You know, you, you were finally acquitted, everyone said, yeah, you, nothing, uh, you didn't do anything bad, but you were in jail for seven years waiting, waiting adjudication. Speed of governance, especially in IT, is critically important, and, no, and that is fundamentally one of the major shifts when we talk about cloud. So let's talk now about that same framing, but what are the unique challenges that cloud has for governance practices, right? First one is agility. Your business is moving to public cloud, moving to AWS, moving applications there because they want to achieve agility. Maybe they want, maybe it's also, there's also cost plays there, but fundamentally every single enterprise that I've ever spoken to, their primary reason for moving to cloud is to gain agility. When I used to work at a Fortune 50 healthcare services, uh, or uh, uh, healthcare services company, the, um, uh, it took six to eight weeks to have a VM delivered to an application team, right? And this is not procurement time. This is, there is already hardware sitting in the data center and someone needs to procure or a provision a VM on top of that hardware and then give access to an application team member. Six to eight weeks. That's incredible. Well, the reason that is, the reason that occurred is that there were multiple manual processes with queue times and those tickets w went around between the various teams that all had to interact with each other and do that. And so you have basically this ticketing system and a flow and all of that happens. Now, it feels, it feels actually, I was, just, I was just at a customer site and we were sitting there trying to do something live and it was like six minutes and like we were waiting for this Windows instance to spin up. And it was like, this is taking forever, right? And it's like now, like six to eight minutes, you have an EC2 instance, less time than that, you know, like, and then when you start talking serverless, it's like instantaneous, right? It's, you're starting to measure that in milliseconds uh, when you do that. That agility equation, do not forget that. The second one is expectations. So as governance professionals, as security professionals um, sitting in this environment, you have a huge amount of expectations on you. Amazon is publishing best practices. They released brand new features this week that are brown, uh, groundbreaking around uh, security policy um, uh, that can be measured uh, uh, logically, right? Uh, and, and then you've got CIS publishing standards, you've got NIST, you've got HIP, you've got all these different organizations that are essentially saying, here are the best practices for doing these things. And when you don't follow them, when you don't have them in place, when you do have an issue, then it's your problem. It's not that application team, right? It's, it, it's gonna come back to the governance professional and say, 
you could have known about this. You were at reInvent in 2019. You heard all these things. Why didn't you implement them, right? So the expectations become your requirements. Those best practices that are published because they're known in the world are become your requirements for your organization. And then the last piece is control. Central IT has lost control of the infrastructure, right? We no longer deploy, have those long lead times to deploy things, and it can't queue through the environment. So applications, the, the application code itself can actually spin up the infrastructure, and in that model, the control is now on the application team. How they design their application to scale within the cloud is going to control what infrastructure is deployed. So all three of those things are tightly coupled, and, and in some ways we feel like they're kind of fighting against each other, um, but they're not really, and uh, hopefully I can, I can show you that. So let's talk for just a minute, and I'm gonna compare what we used to do in IT governance uh, to compare to what we can do today. So first thing is on the rules, right? So we talked about rules. We used to have you know, control frameworks, big, thick, thick documents, uh, PDFs, stored in a document management system. We trained everybody. We put it on their GNOs for the year that they had to be trained three times a year on our frameworks. They open up the document. They look at it, the first page. They close it, and they check the box that they did the training, right? Um, and then we give them some checklists. Like, we, if you're more advanced, maybe you gave checklists. And so now they have checklists they can follow and make sure that they're following those things. That's not possible in the cloud. When you move to public cloud, in order to automate the infrastructure of that, you need thousands of policies. Not just policies like don't do bad things, like don't open up public buckets. You need policies like what's your subnet naming scheme? What is the hostnet naming scheme for a new EC2 instance that spins up? What are your acceptable CIDR ranges? How do we prevent those CIDR ranges from overlapping? You need a policy engine and you need policy code that can look at all those things and fundamentally make decisions about how to automate, right? Without, and without all of those rules decided on, you will never be able to automate your infrastructure. You need to decide on those rules up front and you need to capture them. From an oversight standpoint, we talked about it earlier, um, if you're in a, you know, normally what I've seen in, in large enterprises is that people do an architecture review generally a day before they have to deploy to production um, and, then, and then they kind of use that as a mechanism to kind of get the security teams to give them exceptions. Uh, and then if you're lucky, if you're a high value add application, you'll have an internal auditor come in maybe once a year or once every other year, look at your application and see if things are, are done as they were written, right? Um, that's not what you need to do in cloud. We need real time event um, correlation. We need to be able to respond to that creation of the infrastructure that's happening in real time that the application's controlling and respond to that. From a management standpoint, we had those central services and IT operations that we could queue through. Um, now we've got you know, automation around those platform services and the infrastructure services. And protection is interesting as well. Uh, it used to be we thought about protection in terms of barriers, right? Let's do the physical security around our data center. Let's do the perimeter security around our network. And we're in this like, nice bastion and, uh, and no, no, one can, no one can get by our moat, right? And in the world of cloud, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit more detail, but you need preventative and corrective controls that are running in real time and looking at your systems and deciding that. You can't protect the perimeter. Your perimeter is now the entire internet. What you have to do is protect each of the individual assets that are running within your environment. And then finally, transparency, my favorite, my favorite topic, if you guys haven't figured that out. Uh, we used to update the CMDB once, if you're lucky, when that application deployed or was updated, right? If you had a good architect, he checked to make sure that everyone checked their information, their, their architecture diagrams into ServiceNow. Hopefully someone captured all the host names of the servers that were launched. Uh, maybe someone updated the list of software that was installed on those servers, if you were lucky, right, if you were good. Now, you can programmatically, you can query APIs and find out what's in your environment. That idea of having a static CMDB that's updated upon change of your application is completely out the window. You need a real-time cloud scale CMDB. You need to know every configuration change that's happening, whether it's progr happened programmatically or happening via uh, people that are taking actions within your environment. So, I really love this. I really love this quote. But um, in order to, uh, one of the major things that you're gonna have to decide early on in your governance process, this is the major pillar that is gonna decide whether you accelerate quickly to the cloud. Um, we took, uh, we had a, a speaker here last year uh, from a biopharma company 
they went from zero dollar spend on AWS, they wanted to, they made a decision to do a full data center migration, went from zero dollars in AWS spend to $500,000 in AWS spend in less than six months, right? And fundamentally, this next decision that you make around this is going to decide whether you are a fast adopter and, and quick adopter of the cloud, or whether you take a really long time and a, and a slow ramp up to that. Everyone's gonna get there, it's just, it's just how fast you go. And what I'm talking about is multi-account isolation. A single most important decision that you're gonna make as part of your governance strategy is do you do multi-account isolation or not? And this is what I typically see, which is that early on in cloud adoption, you've got a cowboy, someone on your, on your R&D team that goes and swipes a credit card, they build an account, they build an application that gets a lot of buzz, a lot of interest from, uh, you know, from the business, and they become a hero, and they've got their, they've got their AWS account out there, um, and it, it's a sole thing. Now they've created a lot of interest in it. They've interested some other application teams in doing that. And then they say, hey, come, come work. You can, you can have some space in my account. I've got, I'll create you a new VPC, or you can come in my VPC, right? We can all, we can all share this together. We'll be happy roommates, and we'll make that work. Um, and then that starts to get old. You start to get two or three people into that account. They start to do lambdas and they start to cross over or someone is trying to fix their application and they change the security group and then they break. They break someone else's application. And, and what, happens, what happens when they break someone else's application? If anyone, I'm sure I, I heard a lot of laughter in the audience. As soon as they break someone's uh, application, IT comes in and says, please stop, you guys are doing this all wrong. We know exactly how to do this. We have a playbook, it's called ITIL and now we're gonna roll it out. And we're gonna have services and you guys are gonna basically say, this is what I need, and you're gonna ask the service team to deploy it, and that service team's gonna go deploy it for you. Everyone's gonna be nice and neat and clean. Our centralized teams are gonna keep everybody from stepping on each other's toes. And this is, as a governance architect, as a security professional, as a CTO, this is the primary point of decision making that's gonna decide whether or not your cloud accelerates or not, because if you do that model, you will not be in a good place. Um, you will be here in three years, only having moved a few workloads, and uh, and not have the cloud adoption, that not have the benefit of the strategy that you put in place. We feel the right model is to lean into multi-account isolation to gain a whole suite of benefits in that process. What multi-account isolation is, is you isolate workloads into different AWS accounts. That's right, so every AWS account, the same account structure that separates Corporation A from Corporation B now separates Application A from Application B even to the point of separating application A's test environment from their production environment, right? Even to the point of separating application A's microservice one and microservice two and microservice three into separate accounts, if you really wanna get crazy, I think AWS has some customers out there that we've uh, talked to that have like 20,000 AWS accounts. Now, that's super scale in this model, but more accounts is better than no accounts. And the reasons of that, right? There's a, there's a bunch of reasons. The first one is that you can group resources together. Grouping resources together into accounts are a great way to manage costs. I can have all of my application teams uh, have separate accounts. I can, they can have the costs of those accounts charged back to them directly. You also limit the blast radius. So if something bad happens, if you have a bad actor come into the environment, if someone makes a change that cascades, uh, then that blast radius is, uh, is limited. How many, let me see, just see a show of hands, how many people today are currently under change freeze, year-end change freeze in their on-premise environments? Yeah, about half um, for the people on, on the video. Um, and, and the rest of you will probably be in year-end change freeze in a couple weeks. Um, so uh, the reason that we have year-end change freeze is because businesses close their books. Public companies need to provide financials to the street at the end of the year and they need to close their books quickly and it's Christmas time and it's New Year's and no one wants to be in IT and be working and trying to get an ERP system or another system up and running at that time of the year, right? So we implement these change freezes to prevent cascading changes in the environment. Now you have a developer working on a new application that's gonna drive new business basically told that they can't deploy anything new to their environment until January 5th or January 15th, right? This is fundamentally what we don't want to replicate in the cloud. If you put things together, if they're in the same environment, you are gonna run into that exact same change problem and you're gonna be, that you're gonna have the same, um, you're gonna have the same lack of agility in the cloud that you do on-premise. 
Um, it, this also, a surprising thing, uh, people don't think about this, is account limits. So AWS has pretty sane account limits for new accounts. So if you're building an application, uh, you can spin that up. If you're putting, you know, if you're putting uh, a 500 accounts, or 500 applications into a single account, you're gonna hit every single uh, AWS uh, account limit that exists. Now a lot of those can be upped, you can call support, you can get account limit raised, you can get your API limits raised, et cetera. But those, there are some things that are hard limits that you can't have raised as well, and then you have to work around, right? So, um, so by separating applications into separate accounts, you reduce that noise by 95%. You'll still have some big applications that like bump into those things and they can, they can manage that themselves, but by and large, all of your dev accounts and most of your production accounts will never need to ask for account limits uh, raises anymore. Then uh, user access. Accounts are great ways to segregate user access uh, in your environment, right? So uh, we had, uh, at, how many people were at Reinforce last year? Okay, that's a pretty good number of people. If you were at Reinforce, uh, we had a speaker there, uh, one of our customers, McGraw-Hill Education. They have, like 80, uh, they have like 80 different two pizza teams, right? They have those two pizza dev teams, they have 80, different of, you know, 80 of them, and they're all working on different applications and different stages of lifecycle development, right? Accounts are great ways to separate and provide user access only to the resources that those teams are working on. They can't see logs from other applications, they can't steal code from other applications, they can't break other applications. It's a great way to do user access. Uh, and then primarily though, when you think about this, it is fundamentally possible if you're just lifting shifting from on-premise and bringing a bunch of EC2 instances in to manage this through tagging and other things. But as soon as your teams start to build cloud native applications, try and get four or five development teams working on a Lambda-based application, all working in the same account, and then come talk to me. It's, it's, not, it's possible, but it's, it's, it's a lot of overhead to manage it. Um, the last point I'll do on multi-account isolation for all you regulated companies is auditability, right? If you have multiple applications running in the same account and an auditor comes in and they start looking at that application and that application shares logs or shares data or shares change with other applications, they immediately can expand their, their audit scope to those other applications, right? So they find a change that occurred within the account, and then they start tracing that back, and they find that's application B. Application B now came in scope of that audit, right? So you just incre increased your audit risk by a factor of X, depending on how many applications you have in that environment. Those are all great things. Uh, I, I fundamentally believe this is, that, that's, the, that's the key to, uh, that's the one key decision. We're gonna talk about another one here, which is the maturity model and which way we go. So I see three basic models for companies that are adopting cloud. Um, they generally look at control and agility as opposite ends of the spectrum. We're either gonna have control or we're gonna provide agility, right? A lot of companies are stuck in this, stuck in viability, so they just spend weeks or months or years actually trying to figure out how to do this stuff. They come to reInvent, they get information, they go back, they put together PowerPoint decks, they share them with each other, they talk about what they're gonna do, they talk about what they're gonna do more, they talk about what they're gonna do more. They never launch a single server, they never create a single account, or maybe they create a dev account and they play around with it a bit, but they don't really do a lot, right? And then you have other organizations that actually go, yeah, no, we're gonna do this, we're gonna roll out ITIL, and we're just gonna move all of our existing on-premise processes out to the cloud because we know that's safe and secure, and if we do that, there's not gonna be any questions, we don't have to change anything, we just roll all that out. And so what you end up with is an environment that's fairly stagnant. It's same, similar to on-premise, same processes, et cetera. Um, you don't have a lot of agility in that environment, and your business partners start to get antsy. When those business partners start to get antsy, you start to see those rogue actors come out, they start building things, swiping their credit card, doing stuff on the side. Eventually one of them will do something stupid and get in trouble, and then IT will come back in and they'll start bringing those things in, they'll, they'll, they'll pull them out of there, and then they'll even go farther into the control frame and you'll have even less agility, right? The other model isn't really good either, right? You, have, you end up having, you know, IT basically just publishing some best practices and then letting the cloud teams go and do whatever they want. I have a large multinational company that we work with that did this for five years. They ended up with 400 AWS accounts, all different teams, no control, everybody using the same CIDR address ranges, using default VPCs. You had some teams that were super due diligent and came and did all the research and did everything right, and you had other teams that basically just started spinning stuff up and not giving uh, one care in the world in terms of what they were doing, right? And now they're trying to bring all that back. And as soon as you start bringing that back, 
it doesn't feel good, right? It never feels good. There's something about the human condition. We hate having things taken away from us. And so no matter what the benefit side of that is, right, you as a governance team, if you're doing this late stage, you're gonna, you're gonna be the guys that are saying, no, stop doing what you're doing, et cetera, right? So, what's, so if those aren't the right ways, what's the right way? Well, fundamentally, I think this is the magic trick that nobody knows about or no one really thinks about, which is that we always think of governance and we think of this control and agility as being opposite ends of the spectrum. But the reality is when done right, when done through automation, the control aspects, the governance aspects are the actual thing that sets your cloud free and accelerates it to what it's doing, right? Because think about it, if you do governance right, if you provide all those five services through your governance platform and you automate it, those developers can immediately, they're not worried about like the five minute server anymore, they're worried about the five minute account. Everything is set up for them. Their VPC is set up, their logging is set up, the you know, guard duty is set up, cloud trails are set up. We're gonna to talk about some of the architecture of that. Everything is in place and ready for them to start building their application. You've just accelerated their project timeline by an order of magnitude. They can, they can go try something, they can fail quickly, they can turn it all off if it's done. The magic trick here is that the governance that we've been afraid to put in place is actually the thing that sets you free and allows you to accelerate and execute your business strategy. So what, is, what, are, what, are the, what are the capabilities of that, right? So you need to have central logging set up. You need to have identity federation set up. You need to start writing some scripts. You need to be tagging resources. You need to be you know, looking at the, um, you know, at the environment. How do, I, you know, how do I set up guard duty? How do I do that consistently? How do I, you know, how do I make sure that CloudTrail is sending to a central bucket, et cetera? Et cetera. Um, you need to create some boundary limits. What can people do and can't people do? Are they allowed to use any region? Are they allowed to use subsets of regions? Right, you gotta, you gotta think about that. And then you wanna start building some checking scripts. Let me check what they're doing. Let me see what they're spinning up and make sure that they've got encryption on. Let me make sure that they've got data protection set and they're backing up data. Also, um, let's record change, right? We talked about that cloud scale CMDB. Everything that's changing within the environment, if we're checking it, then we can record that and we can see what's happening. And now we can start looking at those events and triggering off of them. So now when someone spins up an EC2 instance, we can kick off our Lambda, we can see what's going on and, and drive that. And then we can start notifying people. Hey, I saw that you created this security group and you opened up SSH to the default route. That's not our policy, the automation put it back. Um, hopefully that's an automated uh, message that they get. Exception management is really interesting because in exception management is the thing that most people don't think about when they're doing this. I talked about having thousands of policies. For every policy that you write, you're gonna have multiple exceptions for, right? So every policy will have an exception. There will be approved exceptions in your environment. The most common overall overarching policy for everybody in this room is probably no public access to S3, right? But we probably all have website accounts and they have public S3 buckets to serve, to, you know, to serve binary objects. It's a perfectly valid use case. It's a great use of the tool. That is an exception that needs to exist in your environment, and you will have thousands of those exceptions, and then you have to have a way to manage them. You have to know who created the exception, who approved the exception, when was it created, um, what are the, uh, what are the, uh, what's the approval uh, time frame for that, right? Does that exception go away after 90 days? Was it a POC that we allowed somebody to try out something and then we pull it back? Those are the things that you have to manage. And then finally, uh, the transparency equation, we need a dashboard. We need a way to share this information with our stakeholders who are, who are basically funding this effort and be able to show them what we're doing. And we also need a dashboard to our citizens, right? To our application teams, to our data scientists, so that they know what's going on as well. So at this point in time, I think the second major thing that you have to think about, and a lot of pushback I get. So I was ta I've maybe talked to 300 people in the last two days at the booth. And the major pushback that I get is, we don't need that because we do everything through configuration, right? So all of our architectures are designed, they're built into CloudFormation templates or Terraform templates, they're checked into version control, we have architects looking at them and building them. And so we don't really need to check all this stuff behind the scenes because no one can ever do anything in our accounts, right? The only way to do anything in our account is to go through this whole process. And I don't dissuade anyone from that. That is a great use case. It's a nirvana of infrastructure as code that we all should aspire to get to. Um, however, it doesn't work for everything, right? So you have the default configuration of a brand new account, right? A lot of that can be built as stacks, but some of it can't. 
you have pre-existing accounts, right? So you'll have those rogue users that already had their AWS accounts, and then you'll also have mergers and acquisitions. When you get those M&As, and then you have another entire organization that comes into your environment, and you have a time crunch of 90 days to get the M&A done, and you have to bring them into your governance platform, right? You also have ad hoc configuration that happens, right? Someone's trying to troubleshoot a production issue, and they jump into the console, and they change something. You have to deal with that. You have infrastructure as code, right? I have a company that's doing IoT. They are providing an IoT service for other businesses. So people are logging into their application on a minute by minute basis and signing up for the service. And if they sign up for the service and they check the box that says I want my data isolated, these guys spin up separate VPCs, separate databases, separate instances, right? The, the application architecture is, is dynamically responding based on the usage of the application. There's no way that you can do that through Configuration. There's no way that an architect could look at the configuration of that application at the beginning and say, yep, that looks good, right? You need to be looking at it at runtime and seeing how it's behaving with the variables that were built into it. And then finally, elevated access, right? Uh, most of our financial services customers, this is their main concern, which is regardless of how much control you have, there is somebody in your organization that has access to your AWS organization's account that can create exceptions to your SCPs, that can log into those accounts and circumvent any control that you have in place and do something, right? And you need an audible mechanism to be able to tell what they did, when they did it, why they did it, um, give them that access for a limited amount of time, tie that specific access to a specific ticket that they were working on, and if it's not tied to a specific ticket they're working on, sit down and have a conversation to them as to why they were logged in as super user during, at 2 a.m. on Thursday night, right? So you, the continuous compliance is re required regardless of the maturity of your CI-CD pipeline in your, in your architecture. You need to have both, defense and depth. So now that we've talked about the requirements of of this architecture, of this governance platform that we're gonna build. Now let's walk through the fun part, and let's walk through an architecture. So before we start putting a single line of code in place, I'm gonna sit down, we're gonna whiteboard out what the actual architecture will be to, to create this application. So the first thing that we're gonna need is an AWS organization, right? AWS organization is the foundation of what we're building here. We're going to create an, create an organization, we'll create a billing account, um, create a, a central logging account, We'll create a networking account, central networking account for our direct connects and our VPNs. We'll create an audit account for the auditors to come into where um, all that data goes. And if we're doing single sign-on, we'll probably have a single sign-on account. There might be some other core service accounts that you build into this as well. It just kind of depends on the architecture that you're doing. You then have to make a lot of decisions around IAM. Am I going to use programmatic users? Am I going to use roles? Am I going to use combinations of groups and users and roles to achieve different control objectives, right? The problem with doing one of those things is that if you, if you go into roles, you're either gonna have a lot of roles that you manage, which people don't like to do, or you're gonna have roles that are very broad in scope, right? And then you have users that have a lot more access than they need. So you really have to fundamentally decide between fine-grained access for an individual person or, or fine-grained access for a role and then have a lot of roles. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're, we obviously, we wanna track everything that we're doing. CloudTrail is a preeminent service. Every single API call that you do on AWS goes through CloudTrail, so we need to have that as well. Um, so now, we're developers now, right? We're a governance team. Uh, we used to write documents and, wipe and, and frameworks, and now we're gonna be writing code, so we need a code development environment. Let's uh, start looking at the Amazon SDKs. Pick your favorite one. I like Python. Our developers like the, the Node uh, SDK. And then um, you need a place to store that code, so code commit is a great re repo, uh, Git repo for that, that's private within your environment. Uh, and then we can start orchestrating some of this stuff together. We put our code into code commit, we then create a pipeline through code deploy, and then we get some cloud formation templates and some lambdas, and lambdas out the other end that start building the account structure that we do. This is the table stakes of doing this um, on your own and building this, this infrastructure, right? So what are we gonna do? Oh, first thing we'll do, we'll, we'll set up a dev app where we're gonna test this automation that we're building, right? So we need a Canary account that we can actually build and we can test our governance automation in that space. Um, we're gonna connect that to AWS single sign-on or our favorite single sign-on of choice. We need to make sure that we're tracking, that we're using KMS, right? You know, Werner loves to wear the encrypt everything uh, t-shirt. Encryption is one of the easiest, lowest cost things that you can do that adds a measure of security. Uh, so you have to decide, hey, I'm gonna make people use customer managed keys and if I do, do I make sure they're rotated, et cetera? So you have to make those decisions and then build the automation for it. 
Am I going to hook all my accounts up to guard duty and monitor all the API activity through guard duty? And then writing the automation that invites those new satellite accounts into your organization uh, and then sets up the guard duty master slave environment. We might hook all that up into security hub so we have visibility to it. We definitely need to turn on AWS config and config rules and look at some of the existing rules and probably write a lot of our own on top of that. Um, and then we start talking about the you know, EC2 instances. If you're a large enterprise, you have a lot of on-premise stuff you want to move over to cloud, you want to make sure that stuff is patched. SSM is a great tool for interrogating what's on your instances and then also patching them. And then you have all of those default VPCs that are sitting out there. So the interesting thing about default VPCs is that what happens is you leave those def default VPCs in place and you want to build your environment all in US East 1. You, you set up all your direct connects to US East 1, you create all that. A new user comes in, they get their new account, they log into AWS for the first time, and they start building stuff, and they start putting stuff into their VPC. And two weeks later, they figure out that they just built all that in US East 2, because that was the default setting on the browser when they, when they came in, and they didn't switch, right? So really important thing to do when you're, when you're bootstrapping an account is deleting all the default VPCs. You need a script for that, right? And then you need scripts to stand up your VPC. What are your design patterns for your VPCs? What is the t-shirt sizing for that, right? You probably have a small, medium, large VPC, maybe uh, you know, a, slash, uh, a slash 26 as a small, a slash 24 as a large, a slash, 22, or a slash 24 as a medium, a slash 22 as a large. You need to define the CIDR ranges that are acceptable for that use because you don't want these application teams stepping on each other's CIDR ranges, uh, so you need to build that in. And then you need to connect that VPC to your transit gateway, right? You had your networking account, that's where you ran your direct connects or your VPN. You're now going to connect that VPC that you did to your transit gateway. So you have your networking in place, you have all your security control plan in place, you've deleted all the default VPCs, and now you're really ready to get cooking. So I'm gonna onboard an account. What's the first thing I need? I need a database of accounts, right? What are the accounts that I have? What are the metadata around them? What's the account tags? What is the, um, what's the purpose of that account? Who owns it, et cetera? So I need an account table. DynamoDB is a great tool. Um, you can quickly create an account table. It's NoSQL, uh, it's schemaless, so you can just kind of continue adding data to it over time as you find that you need new data. And you also need a place to store all of your logs, right? So all of these Lambda functions that are running, some of them will work and some of them will not work, right? Uh, you never know. You might show up on a Tuesday and Amazon announces a new type of availability zone in Los Angeles that has a different format than in a naming convention than every other availability zone, and it breaks some of your regex in some of your lambdas, and so then you have to respond to that, right? So you need a place to store your log and configuration files so that you can see when things are working and when things aren't working. So now, after all that's ready, we're ready to launch our first production account. We create that account and we're gonna vend that to the team. As soon as I vend that to the team, they're gonna start building things, right? And so I wanna see what they're building, right? I wanna have visibility, I wanna have that real-time access to what's going on, so I need to build an event stream around that. So I take that CloudTrail information. So CloudTrail's monitoring everything in their account. Every time something changes, an API call is made, I send that to CloudWatch. CloudWatch filters it. There's, I don't care about everything, I care about certain events. I filter the events in CloudWatch, I send them to SNS, and I put them on a queue. Right? So I now have a series of events that I've put on a queue, my lambdas pick that up, and now when someone launches an RDS instance in a public subnet, I know about it, and I can write a rule that says, that's not acceptable, let's terminate that instance and send that user a message that they're not allowed to do that. That is the fundamental architecture that you need. You can then start building bell bells and whistles on top of it, right? Um, the next set of data elements that you're gonna record are what are the events, what are the notifications, what are your policies that you've written, um, and then what are the exceptions that you've written? And you probably need a relational database for that. Um, Aurora is a, a great solution um, for that as well. You can also create some visibility into your log files that you're, that you're putting into S3 using Athena. Um, so all those log files, you'll have, you literally have millions of log files sitting there uh, after a few months because you're monitoring all these things in the real-time events. You'll have millions of log files. Athena is a great way to kind of research and, and get information. And then you can use something like SES for sending email notifications. This is that fundamental architecture that you need to build in order to do that governance at scale. You can do this all on your own. It is a lot of fun to build. Uh, you'll learn a lot along the way. Um, if you don't have time to build that, or you don't have the team that has the expertise to build that, um, uh, that can be tough, because Amazon is pushing 1,000 changes a year. Just this week, 
Like we went from 165 services to like 175 services. We'll probably be in the 180s before the week's over, right? Um, they have 16 regions and growing. Um, that is a huge amount of change to absorb. You need a big team that's monitoring that stuff and doing it. When Amazon releases a new service, your job as a governance architect is to evaluate it, to say what is the enterprise configuration of that service and what are the guardrails that I need around that service to make sure if it's gonna be used within my environment or not. Um, so you need the team in place in order to do that. How Turbot thinks about this is we think about it in terms of creating that freedom for the application teams, making sure that the cloud team has automated guardrails, giving the cloud team the ability to specify their policies and define them uh, the application teams, though, fundamentally need to have self-service. Those application teams, we want them to directly use the cloud. We want them, if they like using the console, let them use the console. If they want to use Terraform, let them use Terraform. If they want to use the CLI or the APIs, let them use those things. Do not abstract your users from the tools that they love. That will slow them down. Let them use whatever tool. But you've got to be cognizant that You've got to run alongside, you've got to watch what they're doing, and you have to put guardrails and boundaries in place of what they can do to prevent them from creating risk for the organization. And that's essentially what Turbot does. We have the software that we were just talking about, a very similar architecture to this that you can deploy within one of your environments that monitors all the activity across all of your clouds, or all of your, all of your clouds and uh, all of your accounts, um, and Kubernetes and the OS level. Um, we do that in real time, we ingest all that information, and then we do real time matching of your policy sets against that data and tell you what's wrong and give you the tools in place to automatically remediate them. So let me uh, just quickly drop over to a demo and kind of show you how we do that. So this is the, this is the Turbot console, this is our web-based UI um, that we provide to our citizens and let them see what's going on. So uh, this is a governance architect view, but it can also be an uh, end user and application team view, uh, a, a, you know, a dashboard for you know, your management as well. So I'm logged in here to this reInvent uh, demo account, and I have access to that account. So that single sign-on, the federated identity that we were talking about before, I can simply choose a role that I want to log in as, and then get an STS session out to AWS. So with that single click, I was able to authenticate to AWS with a time-limited STS token. I only have access for a limited amount of time. What's important about that is that the users never have access keys or credentials that they can take with them and go home and sign into your environment. In order to, do, in order to log in, they need to be on your network because the software, your, your cloud portal is essentially running on your intranet. So when those users go to log in, they have to be on your network and they have to authenticate to that environment before they can actually log in and do anything, right? And that's typically a federated identity, right? So you're logging in with SAML, you're logging in with ADFS, you're logging in with your you know, AD user credentials, et cetera. That's how you get access to the environment. And then you can then get access, uh, I just showed access in the console, but this works the same way. The same SDS sessions work uh, vended through the CLI as well as uh, through the API. Right, so you can write automation around this. You don't have to give out access keys uh, and you don't have to give out user credentials to any user. That's really important uh, in, terms of, in terms of securing your environment. So now when I'm in here as a user, I can do some things. So I don't have, uh, I don't have a bunch of uh, scripts done, so I'll just uh, create a few buckets here. Reinvent demo 003. If I could spell. And I will uh, create the bucket. And I'll take a look at it. So you can see when I created that bucket, I basically created what we call a naked bucket, right? So I didn't really do any configuration to it. I didn't add any tags to it. I didn't any, add any default encryption. I didn't add any versioning. I was pretty pretty bad steward of my environment. Um, on the flip side, though, Turbot knows about that bucket, right? So, so 
Turbot already discovered that bucket existed. Why did that exist? Because we used that architecture I was talking about earlier. CloudTrail sent an event through SNS back to SQSQ. Turbot Lambda picked that up and basically said, oh, there's a new bucket that was just created. Right? And now if I look at the activity on that bucket, I can see the activity. I can actually see all the way down here, less than a minute ago, myself as this uh, persona, Wade Watts, logged in, created the bucket, and then Turbot started working on it, right? And we have a lot of policies that we do on bucket. First thing that we do is we ingest all of the current configuration of the bucket. And you can see that configuration uh, right here in this details page. This is a YAML configuration of all of the things that exist on that bucket. Um, and then we started to alarm. Why did we alarm? So let's look at, let's look at some of these alarms. So first, uh, or we had a couple alarms here. First alarm is that the tags weren't set correctly. So I have standards as an enterprise around how I tag information and how I make that work. I also have standards around versioning, right? So in this case, I have versioning set correctly, or not set correctly, so versioning wasn't enabled. And encryption in transit um, wasn't enabled, and probably encryption in REST wasn't enabled as well. So yeah, see, default encryption at REST was enabled. Now, that triggers additional lambdas that then go fix those things, right? This is the key to, to compliance at scale. If you are a governance team and you have something that's scanning your environment once a day and sending you a list of a thousand things that are wrong, you are swamped, right? You are never gonna be able to write that application because you're gonna be spending your entire time in email basically conversing with those application teams, begging them to please change their stuff and fix it. Right? You need automation that will automatically fix it at the time that they provision um, those resources. So all of that happened within, so if you look at this, 12.13 uh, p.m., uh, I created the bucket, and by 12.14 p.m., we did that. So if I go back into the S3 management console, and I now refresh the bucket, we can see that I've set now, Turbot has set default encryption, AS256, it set a bunch of tags on the bucket. Oh, and look, it says, this is a bad tag. Environment can't be blank, right? You need to have an environment, but Turbot doesn't know what environment this bucket is, so let me tell it that it is a prod bucket. So I just told it it's a prod bucket. Uh, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. And then uh, Turbot also enabled versioning for that bucket. Now, let's say, for sake of argument, that Versioning is expensive. It's not really expensive, but let's just say it's expensive for my use case, and I don't want versioning on on development environments, right? Um, that's not something that Turbot has a built-in guardrail for. So how do we how do we approach that problem? I'll go back to my view here. Um, I'm going to take a look at so this is uh, so I'm going to look at Turbot policies now. Um, so we're going to go in here to policy types. I'll go to AWS. Go to S3. Bucket. Approved, oops, sorry, bucket versioning. And then I'll look at the policies around bucket versioning. So I can see that I have, I have one policy here, and it's what we call a calculated policy. Um, a calculated policy is interesting because it now gives your governance team the ability to extend the rules that we've already pre-built in. So I can have a simple rule. If I wanted to, um, if I wanted to create a simple rule on this, I could, switch, I could switch to standard mode, and I could just say, check that it's enabled or enforce that it's enabled. I could do simple rules like that through the UI or through Terraform. Uh, I can also go into this calculated mode. And this calculated mode is really cool because uh, what I can do is, oh well, I don't, need the, I don't need the example buggy, you guys can tell. I can write a simple, um, I can write a simple GraphQL query that looks at, pulls in the bucket tags for a bucket, and then I can look for a tag named environment, and if the environment is dev, then I'll set versioning to disabled, otherwise I'll set versioning to enabled, right? So that's why versioning was initially enabled. The value of that tag was bad tag, and so that didn't match dev. So now that I know that that policy exists and in place, I'll just go back out here, and I'll update my tag to dev, and save it. So now the tag's dev, and let's see what happens on the bucket. So again, that whole event stream is, is still taking place. When I update the tag, that sends a tagging event back through that same tool chain uh, and comes back. Um, you can see that the bucket was updated. 
Oh, the... So you can see that the bucket was updated here, and I can actually see what was changed. So not only do I have visibility into what's going on in my account, but I have line item visibility into how that configuration is changing over time. So I can literally see here, where did that go? Uh, let's see, bucket, template change, bucket updated. So I can literally see that I changed that bucket the value of that individual tag from dev to prod. And we have this granularity at every layer of the infrastructure, all the way down to the OS level, right? Um, and you can also see now that because I've changed it, Turbo also responded to it and set versioning to suspended. So we'll just take a look at that real quick so you guys can tell that I don't have any magic up my sleeve here. So you can see versioning's been disabled on the bucket um, without any action on my own other than updating the tag. Now, that's activity on a bucket. It's pretty simple to do. Let's look at something that's a little bit more advanced, a little bit more, a little bit harder to actually uh, uh, to do, and that is, uh, and that is uh, EC2 instance at the host base level. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to SSM, Systems Manager, and I'm gonna use this awesome tool from AWS called Session Manager. And Session Manager, I'm gonna start a session. This is going to allow me to, um, to start a session on one of these Ubuntu instances that are running here, and I'm gonna get an SSH session. Um, what's really cool about Session Manager is that it's using my federated identity. So if you remember, I logged into Turbot with my enterprise federated identity. Turbot then logged me in with a, with a time-limited SDS token into AWS, and now I'm authenticating at the instance level in that same persona. So I know my federated identity from the enterprise is logged into that server, and every action that I take in here is recorded in CloudTrail. Everything that I do is recorded in CloudTrail. Um, and this is super small, so hopefully, there we go. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is wonder why that's not working. Let's see, view, oh, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm typing, but it's not doing anything. All right. All right, I'm just gonna launch Session Manager again. I'll do this demo instance 05. Maybe there was, maybe there was an issue there with 06. Oh, actually, this might be my, might be my internet connection is waking out here. All right, so let's go to 05 and start a session. And we get a command prompt, sudo. All right, so now hopefully making this bigger doesn't screw it up. Sudo, su, Ubuntu. So I'm gonna switch over to the Ubuntu user. So I log, was logged in as the SSM user. I'm now an Ubuntu user. I can CD to my home. Um, so I can see that a little bit better. So I'm on to this Ubuntu instance. I am an administrator on this instance, so I have access to do things, right? I can sudo. So I'm going to do something bad here. I'm going to sudo to um, etsy ssh sshd uh, conf. Oh, there we go. Thank you. I'll do. I'll do vim. I'll make the vim people happy. All right. Um, so. Uh, so I'm now in SSHD conf, and I'm gonna do a couple bad things. I'm gonna say, eh, I don't care, let's permit empty passwords, and let's um, authorize, uh, let's see, permit root login. So two things, uh, two things that I wanna do, and I'm even gonna, I'm even gonna, gonna like, go to the extent of, of just saying, yeah, I don't care, just permit root login, right? So I'll save that, and now I'll pop back out to Turbot. So in the same way that we get that event stream from CloudTrail, Turbot has a way to bootstrap OS query and be able to send an event stream of all actions that are taking place on your host-based OSs, right? So let's uh, drill in and find that. If I, uh, I'm in uh, US East 1, I'll go back here and 
We've got a couple instances. I didn't notice which instance ID that was. Well, we will we'll take a look. So here is all the information that Turbot knows about that EC2 instance. And then I can actually look at the, the uh, Ubuntu-based host that's running on there. And I can see all the activity. If I want to look at something like, uh, if I want to look at the resources and I want to see all of the, uh, all of the kernel modules um, that are installed in this environment, I can do that. Um, I can also, um, uh, but I can also set policies at this level, right? So I'm at this host level, I'll go filter, policy, uh, AWS. I'm sorry. All policy types, Linux, services, SSH, SSG, SSH config. And we can see here that I've got a bunch of things that I can do. So that permit empty passwords is a policy that we have built into the system. I can see what the setting is for it. Um, for that as well. If I do a new setting here, you can see that I can enforce it into one or more different modes or configurations within the environment. So Turbot's had enough time. It's discovered that we made that change. Um, let's go back and take a look at, at the activity here. Uh, we're on 10.10.51, and we're 10.10.38. So I'm just going to bounce back up here. There we go. All right, so I have that 101031. So I can see that SSHD was updated. I can see what was changed on that environment, and then I can respond to that change and correct it in real time. So you can see here that Turbot actually corrected that back. If I go back to um, my systems manager window and I reopen, um, you can see that, uh, or maybe not. So you see permit empty passwords was set back to no. And if I actually scroll to the end of this document, um, I can go to permit root. Oops. Permit root login. Anyone know what the, there we go. At the very end of the file, Turbot added a permit root login no. So rather than override that setting because I uncommoned it, we actually added a setting at the end that overrode the value, right? So within a few, within a few 15 seconds after making the configuration change, Turbot identified the bad configuration and then rolled it back. And that's really what I wanted to show you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna switch back over to um, the slides and just wrap up. Um, we, what I really wanted to share with you is that we really love this stuff, right? We love building it. We love organizations that are out there building it. Our best customers are organizations that try to write this stuff on them, themselves. We have a platform that we feel can accelerate your journey towards building this type of automation within your own environment. And that platform uh, is deployed within your own account. That platform gives you robust capabilities to detect change, to prevent configuration drift, to correct, to correct configurations as you saw in the demo, um, to create transparency for your entire environment. You can search and find resources across everything and to really enable business agility, to give back to your teams the agility that they sought out for when they moved to the cloud initially. So thank you so much uh, for your time today. Hopefully uh, you got something out of this. If you enjoy these topics and you love talking about them, if you're building it yourself, we would love to talk shop with you and figure out how you're tackling some of these same challenges. Um, please drop by the booth. Uh, or I'll be available here um, after the session for a few minutes to answer questions. Also have Bob Tordella and a couple other team members that can answer questions as well. Um, loved uh, the opportunity to come talk to you today. Thank you all um, for your time and attention.